All right, good morning, good morning. How's everybody today? Great. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? We have an exciting day planned. I hope you're all uh, full of uh, interest and curiosity as we uh, have invited uh, Brother Dan Bellavia, Pastor Bellavia, and his wife Betsy from Ohio uh, to share with us this weekend. We got an exciting day planned, and uh, it all began Friday night. We had a wonderful time uh, meeting with Betsy and Dan over at the the Neal's house, and uh, we had a wonderful meal with the pulpit committee and had the opportunity to sit down with them and get to know these folks, and uh, we, they got to share their hearts, we got to share our hearts, and then yesterday we took them to the woodshed all day long, <laughs> and they really went through the test of fire, and uh, they had to uh, not only uh, be here at 8 in the morning to kick things off, but they had to meet with the pulpit committee and go through a whole bunch of questions, they had to meet with the trustees, they had to meet with the deacons, they went through the mission board and they left here exhausted, but they satisfied uh, us as far as their questions, their answers to our questions, and quite frankly, I'm delighted that they're actually here this morning after yesterday. <laughs> so we're looking, we're looking forward to what God's going to do this weekend. It's going to be an awesome time, and I hope that uh, uh, you're here and that uh, you would be allowing the Spirit of God to move in your heart uh, this day. Uh, that, uh, that God would bring discernment into your life as we uh, go forward. Uh, this is an exciting day, and I pray and I would encourage all of you to set aside uh, this day, and if you can, stay here all day long. We're going to do many things. The pastor's going to preach. Uh, his wife's going to sing. Actually, you're going to get to see Betsy before you see the pastor. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to that, and, uh, and then we're going to have... Uh, Pastor Dan's going to teach the adult Sunday school class right here, and then we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful meal, um, and uh, we thank the women and uh, all those that contributed to uh, the dinner today. We're going to have a wonderful lasagna meal. You're all invited to, to stay, and then we're going to return here to the sanctuary, and we're going to, we're going to get out the 300-watt bulb and the rubber hose and go after them again. <laughs> And then they're going to be delighted to leave here this afternoon, <laughs> I'm sure. But no, that, it's, it's been great. The fellowship has been sweet, and we just thank God for how he's orchestrated this weekend. It's really been a blessing, and uh, I'm looking forward to see how this day uh, winds down. But uh, I, I want you also to be ever mindful of Pastor Lyle and Callie as they travel this weekend. They're in the southern tier visiting some friends and family. And uh, so it was good for them to get away and to, to spend time uh, with folks that they love as they contemplate their future. Uh, I just pray that you would keep them in mind as they travel back uh, either later today or tomorrow and uh, uh, pick up the reins again for another uh, few months. Uh, but uh, I'll have more information about uh, the ground rules and all that we're going to be doing later on today and uh, what we can expect. Uh, but uh, this morning we want to, we wanna, as always, we want to put Jesus on display. That's why we're here. It's all about him. John the Baptist said it best. He must increase, I must decrease. That's why we're here this morning. We're here because we love Jesus. We want to praise and worship Jesus. He's a good God and worthy to be praised. And we're looking forward to what God has laid on Brother Bellavia's heart to share with this congregation this morning. I'm sure it will encourage, and I guarantee you, it will challenge those that are here. Uh, to be more dedicated, more devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So examine yourself this morning to see if you're even in the faith. That's a challenge the Apostle Paul has extended to all Christians. Examine yourself to see if you're even in the faith. So we look forward to what Brother Bellavia brings. And uh, so I will quit talking, and I'll take us to the Lord in prayer, and we'll just turn the service over to the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord. We already sense your very presence, Lord, and we thank you for what you're going to do this day. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that uh, Brother Dan and Betsy had traveling mercies on Friday, and uh, they arrived here safely. We thank you for the wonderful fellowship and the meaningful conversation that was accomplished Friday and Saturday. And we look forward, dear God, to what you have laid on Brother, Bre Brother Bellavia's heart, dear God, as he brings forth your word as he communicates your word, dear God. I know that he's desirous of emptying himself 
and allowing you to use that earthen vessel, dear God, so that you might be glorified. And we just thank you again for this fellowship. We pray, Lord, that they would remain in tune to what's going on, that they would use wisdom, they would use discernment, they would, they, they would uh, understand that this is a big weekend for us here at Yates Baptist Church. And Lord, most importantly, as I prayed earlier with Pastor Bellavia, we pray that you would bring this fellowship clarity and understanding as to what we should and should not do going forward. We also pray that you would bring Pastor Dan and Betsy clarity as to what they should and should not do going forward, Lord. So again, we just commit this day, we commit our lives to you, and we leave them in your very capable hands, and we look forward to what you're going to do this day. And we ask these things in the name above every name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand the sing this morning, overwhelmed.
to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad this morning to be in the house of the Lord? All right. 219, and we'll go into 220 as well.
I'm not sure what we have for announcements other than the norm. Um, Wednesday night is family night, prayer and share. Um, I know that next Saturday morning uh, there's a men's breakfast here at YBC. Mike. over there there's some slips there but if you have a verse that's been in your heart or a direction you think you want to take uh, put it in and we'll vote on it if you look at the itinerary for today's praise and worship and uh, the agenda as it goes down you can see that there's i'm during speaking now during the announcements but there's a a spot there after uh betsy bellavia sings it says Ch children leave for junior church i don't want you to get up when the, the kids i don't want you to get up when she's half singing and leave Wait till Betsy's done and then go down to Children's Church, okay? We just wanted to clarify that real quick. <laughs> okay, we'll turn this over to the choir. You're next.
wish I could sing. <laughs> I would love to be up here with a choir. I'm limited to those one of those guys make a joyful noise. <laughs> That's me. What a blessing. If the, uh, if the ushers would come forward as we prepare for our morning tithes and offerings. Whoever is ushering, ush. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to give back to you, Lord, a portion of what you've so richly blessed us with. We pray, Lord, that you would take this gift, that you would multiply it, and that you would use it, dear God, to increase your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But I apologize. So Betsy uh, Bellavita uh, is going to sing for you this morning uh, during the operatory. Uh, so please welcome uh, Pastor Dan Bellavia's wife, Betsy Bellavia. Turn to Isaiah 40, 21 to 31, and Mark 1, 29 to 39. We'll read God's word. Beginning in Isaiah.
40, verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, no one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just calm is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We're also going to read Mark 1, 29 through 39. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife, mother, lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they had found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. You may be seated. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We're finally at the point where we get to introduce the young man that's going to take the pulpit for the next few minutes. And it's certainly my pleasure to introduce to you backwards on his resume. Uh, but he's been pastoring a church or a couple of churches in Ohio over the last 33 years. So he does not jump from church to church. He's been devoted and dedicated to these churches in Ohio for the last 33 years. He's a graduate of the United Theological Seminary. He has his master's in divinity. He has his bachelor's degree from Houghton College, but most importantly, He's got his high school diploma from L.A. Weber here in Lindeville. <laughs> May I introduce to you Pastor Dan Bellavia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Merle. Go get him, buddy. Thank you so much. You bet. Oh, what a blessing to be here. What a blessing to be here. I, I, I uh, want to share with you uh, uh, a couple of uh, personal anecdotes. One, the last time uh, I was here was uh, uh, to... Uh, say goodbye to my father and and we were able to worship together and celebrate his life uh, we have a long legacy um, uh, here in western new york i'm very proud 
of, of the tradition and uh, uh, what we experienced, uh, many of us, together. Uh, last time I was here, uh, I, w I showed up a little early, and my brother David and I were sitting at the old house on 2289 on Oak Orchard River Road, and, and uh, he, handed me, he handed me a Bible and said, I think this was Dad's Bible, and um, why don't you take it with you? Um, I thought, wow, how wonderful. It even smells like my house, uh, as sometimes things do. I opened it up, and, and inside of it, um, well, there's uh, all sorts of wonderful bulletins. Um, there's a little notice of a cleanup day, uh, and there's other passages in here. There's notes in it, um, uh, wonderful things from, well, from you, okay? And I kept looking at these notes, and I realized, wait a minute, None of this writing is my father's writing. It's my mother's writing. It's my mom's Bible. And so I said, Mom, that Bible that's bound, you know, with the leather and the cross, was that yours or was that dad's? And my mom said, oh, that's my Bible. I didn't realize I was carrying around my mother's Bible. And one of the things that it brought to my mind was the idea that uh, we never really know what made us? We're a combination of different things. And for years and years and years, um, people told me, oh, you look just like your dad. You sound like your dad. And I realized, no, I, I look like my mom. I, I, I sound like my mom. I even cook like my mom. My, my, my dad is an important part of me. So is my mom. We're a combination of many, many things that make us. And as we move through life, we realize that all of those things carry marks. All of those things change us. All of those things transform us. When we follow Jesus, we're transformed by the multiple things that we engage along the way. And one of the things we discover as we've moved through life and as a minister and as a pastor, I've moved through life for 33 years away from Western New York. What I've learned and what I've discovered is that you always take pieces of it with you. And it's a cumulative effect. Your life is built on not just one thing, but many things. Encounters and opportunities God opens doors and reveals to you the newness and the joy of the Lord in every encounter that you have. Now, some of you may know that some of those encounters aren't even good ones. And I'll tell you the same. There's been moments where my heart has been broken and my life has been shattered. And God used even that for good. When we're following Jesus together, we know that in our weakest moments, we can borrow the strength of our friends. In our strongest moments, we can help our neighbors. But it's all about doing it together. When we read the Isaiah passage, from Isaiah chapter 40, we often remember wings of eagles. That's what I always think of. But power that is given by God to the people of God allows us to not tire of the work that we have been given. Yesterday was a long day. But though I was tired by the end, working gave strength. Communicating gave power. The Spirit allowed both of us and you to endure. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has not might. He increases strength. 
when you have no strength, it comes from God. I use this as a preface for what I'm really going to preach about. Because the reality is if you don't like what you hear today, blame it on me. If God speaks, ignore who said it. Because the truth is every pastor that shares with you, every person who takes the pulpit, if we are blessing our people and following our Lord, our words are not ours. Our strength is not ours. Our wisdom is not ours. It comes from God. When we fail, the responsibility is to own it. Not to say, the devil made me do it. For those of you who remember Flip Wilson. Or, worse yet, I did it because of Jesus. We own our flaws. God loves us in spite of them and gives us the power and the grace to live within them. When Jesus enters the picture in Mark chapter 1, he does it at a dinner table at Peter's house. I love the the painting that you'll see in this next slide. It's a South American painting. It shows a family And as I looked at it, the more I looked at it, the more I saw the Lone Ranger figure in the middle as Jesus, surrounded by a table of people from different walks and ethnicities. And in the background, you'll see the window, people gawking in to the house. Baptists will be happy to hear that Jesus shows up for dinner. (laughs) Jesus' ministry is often done in the context of dinner tables. He goes from house to house. He, He operates with an understanding that what his ministry is, is not simply what he talks about, but also how he lives. And one of the most interesting things to me is that often in the scripture, what he he speaks about in the synagogues isn't written down. The, the, The scripture writers don't seem to give you his sermon notes from his talks at the synagogue. But what they do tell you about is the fact of what happens when he speaks. What happens when he speaks is The people of God are stirred in different ways. What happens when he speaks is there are people who are possessed by demons. Now, this is one for the church. That have been in the synagogue for decades. And never were stirred to act. Yet when Jesus takes the pulpit, when Jesus speaks, immediately the demon-possessed people say... Are you here for us? And Jesus casts out the demons. Jesus, we are told in the previous 10 verses of the Gospel of Mark, not only cast out the demons at the synagogue, but he also spoke, and I used to love hearing about this, and I used to try to act like this. He spoke as one with authority. And I remember thinking, and I better speak as one with authority. But here's what we forget about that. you got to know this before you get this. Speaking as one who has authority doesn't mean you're a know-it-all. And speaking as one who has authority doesn't mean you got the answer to every question. Speaking with authority means that you could do what you say. When someone speaks with authority, they're not speaking empty words. And so frequently... In our world today, people who speak, speak with what? Empty words. Every one of us Bills fans, and raise your hand for those who believe, okay? (laughs) Know that we all know exactly what should have happened in those last 13 seconds. (laughs) 
right? We all know what we would have done if it was our turn to kick a field goal. But none of us speak with any authority on that, right? Speaking with authority means that you can't, it's not just talking about it, you can do it. And the beauty of Jesus is when Jesus talked, he could also do it. And so he spoke in a different way. And people paid attention to that because he was able to act on what he said. After the sermon is done, after the coffee and the meet and greet, it was probably tea, it might not have even been that. Who knows what they had there? Falafel. They then went home. And our scripture passage starts when they go home. And Peter and his three friends, his brother and his two business partners, the sons of his two business partners, James and John, I have a tough time saying that in that order because I have a son, John, and James. And my wife tells me, don't say John and James because it's James and John in the Bible. <laughs> it's John and James in my house. And when they show up, they go into the house, and they're there not to preach the word. They're not at the house to do special things. They're at the house to do what you do after church. Oftentimes when we read this stuff, we, we read it as if it's a, a code or it's, it's, it's too difficult for us to stand, understand. The reality is in the Gospel of Mark, the history tells us that the Gospel of Mark was meant to be performed as a reading before the church. It's why everything's so fast. It's why all, they always say immediately after, right? You're, you're, you're expressing it verbally to an audience that doesn't read. And so they were hearing this story, and the story flowed from one thing to the other. We try to pull it apart, and we try to say, what do these three things mean? But if you hear a speech, if you hear a play, and you watch the entirety of the play, do you break down what scene two, act one said? Or do you hear it as one whole? The people that originally heard the Gospel of Mark would have heard it spoken out loud. And they would have heard this understanding of Jesus moving from place to place, calling people in, entering into their lives and their homes. And then when he did that, changing their lives in ways that they never would have anticipated. The first thing that Jesus does is he finds out that Peter's mother-in-law is sick. Now, don't use this as a hammer against your Roman Catholic friends. Don't tell them, oh, that means Peter couldn't have been the Pope because he was married. That's not the point. No one would have cared about that. They would have assumed Peter was married. The reality is what it means is that, when, that Jesus didn't go to heal her. He went to eat. And someone needed healing. Think about it in your life. Think about it in your ministry. You don't go to work one day to talk to a crying coworker. That's not what you're doing there. That's not what you do, right? But when you have a crying coworker, do you say, "Man, I wish she'd stop." Sometimes we do, don't we? When you get to work and you find someone who needs you, that's the time to help. And Jesus helped. He saw what was in front of him. He saw what was important. And if you take a look at the next slide, I love the way it says it. It's so simple. It's so He grasped her hand and helped her up. Just think about that. Just for, it's so easy. It's so simple. He just said, let's go. It was physical. It's going to be interesting because right after this passage that I'm preaching on, Jesus meets a leper. Leper touches him. That's a no-no in the world. In fact, if a leper touches you and you're a Jew, then, you have to, then you're actually unclean. You know what's beautiful about Jesus? When unclean touches Jesus, 
Jesus doesn't become unclean. You know what happens with, with, when unclean touches Jesus? The other person becomes clean. When sick people touch Jesus, they become well. Jesus doesn't get sick. Think about that in the context of, oh, COVID three years ago. Right? What happened? The whole world was worried that if you were in contact with someone that was sick, that it was going to get you sick, and so you stayed away from people that were sick. And sometimes you stayed away from people that were well. Jesus touched sick people. He grasped hands and lifted them up. He went to places not because he was looking for people to heal, but because when he went to places, what did he find? Broken people everywhere. I know Lindenville is a small town, but I'm also sure that you have broken people everywhere. And no matter where you go, you're in missionary land. You're dealing with real people. I also want to know, I want you to know this. When I talk about Jesus going into the house of Peter and healing his mother, Peter's mother-in-law, I want to make sure that you don't think that that means that Pastor Dan is going to come into my house and heal my mother-in-law. That's not who I am. We are the body of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that We can't go in and help people up. We can't grasp hands. We can't lift them up. I just want to make sure that you know that that's not my job as a pastor. I don't have any special dispensation from the Lord to do things that you can't do. We are the body of Christ. So where you go, that's where people need help. That's who you should be helping. The church that doesn't understand that the body of Christ is all of us doesn't understand the authority and power in that statement. You have the ability to help others, to share the gospel, to grasp and help up a friend, to do God's work in the world. The next passage is a little weird. Because if you go to Mark 1, 33 and 34, what you'll discover is that the whole town gathered at the door. Now again, this is a story that we're telling. And and oftentimes when we pull it down into just individual verses, the first thing you'd have to ask is, whose door? Well, Peter's door. When is this? Right after. Why are they gathered at the door? Some some would say, well, maybe they heard that the mother-in-law was healed. No, 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 no. Mother-in-law hasn't even gotten back to bed yet. Okay? News travels fast in a small town, but not that fast. The reality is that they're starting to show up because of what Jesus did at the synagogue. He healed a demon-possessed man. He spoke with authority. Now they finish their lunch, and they're saying, wait a minute, what, was, what, what did he really mean? And so they show up, and they bring all of their sick people, and they say, hey, Jesus, could you help me with this? They, and he healed various, many different diseases of those people. The same day, there was no publicity. They're looking for Jesus, not because they want to hear another message. They're looking to Jesus because they need to be touched by Jesus. They want to feel what it it feels like to be in the presence of God, to be healed, to be whole. We used to have a sign on the door. You've all heard it before because the sign was here as well in different Sunday school classrooms. You've heard it from my father and mother and I know you've shared it with each other. It's not a unique understanding. But the simple message was, Be careful how you live. You might be the only Bible some people ever read. What does that mean? You are the message. You are the fruit. And so Jesus goes and disappears. Jesus did that after he preached. He didn't do what normal people do. He didn't do what what smart people do. Smart people capitalize on that, right? You know, all through his ministry, he'd do something special and they'd say, hey, let's set up a shrine here. 
you know, transfiguration, right? You know, they show up and they say, let's put up some booths. You know, maybe, maybe we could sell T-shirts, right? They, they say things like, you know, oh, Jesus, um, you know, now that you've done this, why, why don't you, um, why, I, I like to think about it, and let, you know, why don't you do uh, the, the, uh, the Fallon show? When I started, it was, you know, it was Carson. But why don't, you, why don't you go on Fox News or MSNBC, talk about it. When the, when the getting's good and the publicity should be there, Jesus always disappears. He heals Lazarus, disappears. He gets baptized, disappears. Heals all these people, disappears. What is he doing when he disappears? He's praying. He's getting close to God. He's trying to... See, Jesus, even as a human being and fully God, fully human, Jesus still operated with the same relationship in bringing in the Holy Spirit. He prayed. Now, now this is a hard thing because I, I don't know, when's the last time you fasted 40 days and 40 nights in prayer? You done it? Jesus did it all the time. People say, well, how did Jesus have all this power? It was just because he was Jesus, right? Well, maybe that fasting 40 days and 40 nights was one of the things that was part of it. Maybe, maybe, maybe the thing was that he was committed, okay? He, he so loved the Father that he spent time with the Father. He didn't do anything without being with the Father. Could he have? It's not about power. It's not about authority. It's not being able to get things done or do things. That's not why Jesus has to do that. It's because guess what? Jesus loves the Father. The Father loves the Son. The Spirit and the Father and the Son are in love together. They want to be together. The problem with having the strength and renewed strength like eagle's wings is that at some point in order to have that you have to walk with God you have to love God enough so that God is more important than dare I say it the bills or the sabers God is more important than your political party God is more important than your entertainment choices God is more important than the things that you think are the most important thing in your life And so when we think it's time to do something else, Jesus knows it's time to go to God and pray, to be renewed, to be strengthened, to be ready for the next act. And when Peter and his friends wake up, Jesus isn't there. So what do they do? Do they say, oh, Jesus isn't here. Uh, let's just wait for him to come back. No. They search for him. They search for him. And when they get there, what do they say? They say, everybody is looking for you. I, I, again, I want you to read this not as if it's the Bible, but read it as if someone's telling you a story. When someone tells you everybody is looking for you, what are they really telling you? Yeah, I'm looking for you. Where, where did you go? When, so, you know, when someone says, they, you, know, you know, they should do this, what they're really saying is, I want that to happen. Peter and Andrew, John and James have just been called by Jesus. They've just seen Jesus do these miraculous things. They've had Jesus in their home. Jesus has healed their mother-in-law. And they wake up and Jesus is gone. Think how frightening it would be to wake up after acknowledging, after realizing that you are in the presence of the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that you have finally heard the voice of God, that you finally experienced something, and you wake up the next day and it's gone. You'd panic too. You'd search. 
You turn over every stone because it's something that you know you've looked for for your entire life. This is Messiah. This is the Lord. And now he's gone. And so they don't look as someone who just goes, oh, I wonder where he's going. It says they exclaimed. They're panicked. They're they're terrified that the one thing that is good in their lives in an occupied, politically oppressed, horrible world was a fleeting moment. Many people, when we deal with God in our relationship with Jesus, we deal with our relationship with Jesus as a fleeting moment. One of the saddest things in the church is that sometimes when someone gets baptized, it's the last time they seriously think about Jesus. There's some people that believe that baptism is is just getting into heaven. And it's in all denominations and all churches. And so I call it collapsing at the starting line. What happens is someone gets baptized and they think that's running the race. They think the starting gun is the finish line. And so what does Paul say? Paul says, I ran the race. I finished. Cross that tape. And now I could collapse into the arms of Jesus. But so many people, they just do it to check off a box because they just want to get saved. I don't want that kind of life in my faith. The Jesus that saved me, the Jesus that loves me, I want to wake up to that Jesus every morning. I want to know that he hasn't left me or forsaken me. I want to know that Jesus is going to lead me. I've got to keep close to him. When Jesus is not in the room, I'm going to find where Jesus is. When Jesus is away from you, pursue God. Just like the sick did. Just like those people went and knocked on the door. Just like the disciples did when they weren't in the presence of Jesus anymore. They didn't just wait. They acted. They pursued. And when they got there, Jesus knew what they meant. Jesus knew that when they said, everybody is looking for you, they really meant, where did you go? Please don't leave us again. So what's the very next verse? But Jesus said to them, let's go to the next one. Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also. See, Jesus is going to preach, but the first thing that he tells us is he's not leaving them. They're coming with them. You see, itinerant preachers don't bring the congregation with them. But Jesus brought his people with them. He said, let us go, that I may preach, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in the synagogues throughout Galilee and casting out demons. Everywhere he, he went, he would find more trouble. There's not a town that doesn't have it, mm-hmm. Right? Everywhere he went, he was able to preach and teach and change lives. And the fascinating thing is some people came with him. And some people wondered about what he said. And some people turned him off. But the ones that followed were never abandoned. He doesn't leave us. But so often we leave him. The continuing story is that The gospel is a story in which Jesus calls us to follow. We never know where that's going to be. It's been the story of my life. I I don't know where God's going to send me. I, 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 I never really anticipated leaving Western New York. In fact, out of all of my brothers, I thought I was the one most likely to live here. Because I'm a homebody. But something happened and God led me other places. Some of it was failures. Some of it was successes. Some of it was good news and some of it was bad news. But the truth is, is that God led me along a path where God was asking me to follow him. God doesn't stay static and in one place. Just like if I came back for you uh, and, and, and we were here ministering together, I couldn't minister like 
Dan Bellavia would have in 1988. Right? I'd say, you know what we need to do? We need, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date myself here. Intentionally, I'm going to date myself. We need to have a lover boy tribute band. Because <laughs> all the cool kids like lover boy. No. Not so much. You can't go back like that, can you? You got to find out where God is leading you. You got to pursue that understanding, that dream, that vision. And in the pursuit of that, you find that the world opens up to you. And that the opportunities for you to love and care and sometimes grasp hands and lift up the sick become present. I want to share with you a quote from a book called Life Together from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of, my, one of my theological heroes, beautiful person. But he says this about community in his book Life Together. He says, the first service one owes to others in a community involves listening to them. Just as our love for God begins with listening to God's word, the beginning of love for others is learning to listen to them. God's love for us is shown by the fact that God not only gives God's word, but also lends God's ear. We do not work for our brothers and sisters when we learn. We do work, we do God's work for our brothers and sisters when we learn to listen to them. So often Christians, especially preachers, think that their only service is always to have to offer something when they are together with other people. They forget that listening can be a greater service. Christians who can no longer listen to one another will soon no longer be listening to God either. Now let's take you back to that wonderful picture at the table. And let's take us back to all of the encounters that we saw in the New Testament with Jesus at the table And how many people jawed at his ears? How many people wanted to hear what Jesus had to say? They kept asking questions. Now, the beautiful thing about Jesus is thank God, thank God that Jesus gives us a good model of a listening leader because Jesus almost never answers the question that's asked. Have you noticed that? Jesus gets asked a question and he says, let me tell you a story. Okay, Jesus gets asked a question. Sometimes he doesn't even answer it. He'll say, here's the answer. Now I'm going to tell you something else. Because Jesus is listening. It's not because Jesus isn't listening. It's because Jesus is cutting to what we call the kerygma, the kernel, the heart of the matter. He's getting to the question that they're really asking. Because every time people ask questions, what were they doing? They were trying to trick them, weren't they? We see it in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're asking questions. They were what we called in today's political world loaded questions, right? And so what does Jesus do? Jesus says, I'm going to cut to the heart of it. I'm going to tell you a story. So people, tell, people will see what Jesus is. Uh, they'll ask Jesus a question about taxes or they'll ask Jesus a question about who's my neighbor because they don't really want to treat, they don't really want to love their neighbor like themselves. So if you don't want to love your neighbor as yourself, what you do is you find a way to define people away from being your neighbor, right? You know, so who's my neighbor? I've got to know who I've got to love. And I've got to narrow that down because I certainly don't want to love that person. Right? And so you find a way to narrow it by asking a question, by making sure that they give you, you know, they, they give you parameters by which we follow. Because the idea that we could love everyone like God loves us, well, we, it's not even a matter of we don't think we could do it. We don't even want to do it. I mean, look at our world today, right? Do you, is our world a bastion of loving their neighbors like themselves? Do you, you, you know why? I, you, you, could, you know how you could tell the spiritual temperature? It's, it's whether you have the temperature of people together. If, if you don't love your neighbor, what I'm going to tell you, you don't probably fully love God. It's the same way with grace. What does is, what is Jesus say in grace? Jesus says, forgive as you've been forgiven, right? What what does he do? You know, when when, when we say the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? 
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or trespasses or sins or whatever you want to put there, right? But, but we are forgiven as we forgive. But the reality is we want to be forgiven like the man who, was, who owed a great debt. But then when we get out of the court and we see someone owes us a little bit, what do we do? Yeah, we shake them down. Love your neighbor. So you sit at the table with all these different people. And they're all talking about different things. And again, look at the guy in the middle. Is he saying anything? Mouth is closed. Everyone else, he's listening. I love the image. It's not an image of Jesus. I'm not going to pretend that it is. But sometimes art gives you an insight in And that inside in shows us a person who's just drinking it in, listening, watching the table conversations. And then you got the rubberneckers outside. They're looking in going, I wonder what they're talking about. Listen and learn. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so wonderful because it saves us from where we are and where we've been. And it sends us to where we need to be. It takes us from a position where we are of no use to the world. And in our love for God and by the grace of God, it allows us to not only be blessed, but also to fundamentally be a blessing to the world around us. Small towns are places where you could have community. Lindenville is a community. Albion, Medina, Orleans County, communities. We're not godly communities anymore. But the beautiful thing is, your community can be. Because where you go, as you enter, the Spirit of God goes with. And your responsibility is not to say, let me tell you something. Your responsibility is to say, let's go. Watch what I do. Sit at my table. I'm going to listen to you and hear your needs. You're going to listen to me and understand mine. And together we're going to grow in harmony, not only with God, but with each other. The Spirit calls us to go. The Spirit has given us strength. The Spirit has shown us the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And together in that spirit, the people of God can accomplish the work of God and do God's will right where we live. Let's pray. Loving God, we're just thankful that you have given to us a gospel that we did not have to accomplish. A gospel that saves us but a gospel that includes us in its work. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that by your death, you gave to us life. We thank you that by your resurrection, you taught us to never fear death and the punishment that the world could give. And by the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit, You taught us that the body of Christ continues to act in your name by your spirit when we're in your will. Descend descend upon us now, Holy Spirit, and help us as the people of God to take the next necessary step. If that step is to walk away from the demons in our lives, to embrace your forgiveness and grace, to become a follower of Jesus Christ, Lord God, we ask that you would descend upon that person. If that next step is to commit themselves to the work of God, to enter into membership at Yates Baptist, to take seriously the fellowship of the church, to love God's people as you love them, Lord God, take that next step in the lives of these people. 
And if that next step is to become one who shares the gospel at table, at home, in pulpits around the nation and world, wherever they live, Lord God, send your spirit so that we would never grow weary of the work of God in Jesus Christ. Bless your people. Fill our hearts. And as we leave, help us to leave with joyful hearts, spirits of reconciliation, and an understanding that the God that reigns in the church is the God that enters the world as we leave. Bless your people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing our concluding hymn. fellowship together. Please don't think that everyone can listen at the same time. Share with your neighbor. Enjoy yourselves. I'll enjoy your fellowship as well. Uh, Let's pray for benediction and then we'll also pray grace. How's that? Loving God, we ask this blessing upon your people as we continue to do your work, as we enter into Sunday school as the next step, and then as we enter into a meal and fellowship uh, continuing, we ask that your spirit would continue along the way. Guide us, protect us, and give us your strength so that the world might know your love and grace through the people of God as we share Jesus with the world in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, everyone.